This morning, we're going to kind of embark on a new series called The Better Life. And uh, this is a, a real exciting uh, topic for me because I think it's something that we all, we all want. We all want a better life. And uh, when it comes to the better life, and by the way, this is just introduction. Okay, I'm going to get this whole message is going to be somewhat introductory to the next uh, seven weeks of content. But we have to do it this way because I have to lay the, lay the groundwork. Okay. So if you're here today, you have to come the next seven, and uh, you just have to, and, or else you're just going to get an introduction. Nobody likes to read the introduction and not the rest, so uh, I will give you the conclusion at the end, because that's what you do at the conclusion. Anyway, so uh, uh, you, you know, having a better life really is, is, uh, is wonderful. We, we, we look for, a, we look for a, a, better, uh, a better life. We look for what's next, and when we want what, what God wants, that's really ultimately the best, Right? When we want what God wants, because God wants something for us that's really the best, so we have to figure out what it is He wants and then want that. Does that make sense? We have to figure out what He wants and then we have to go after that, and then we'll have a better life. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, there are some things that we need to do, though, to figure out where better is. And, and as I begin to think about how, how, to, how to connect this, I think about um, uh, point A to point B, right? In our lives, there's a, uh, there's a destination, and that's better than where we are right now. And when it comes to figuring out a destination, when it comes to figuring out how to have a, how to have a better life, follow me now, we have to figure out where we are right now. Okay, So to get from point A to point B, you have to determine where point A is. Does that make sense? So if we're going to punch in on a GPS... Uh, how to get, uh, let's say, to, to downtown Davenport, uh, we would have to also factor in where we are at now. And if we can figure where we're at now and the destination, all we have to do is basically draw the line between the two and say, now we just need directions. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, is where are we at right now? Okay? And, and you might think, well... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad place, or I could be in a better place. I'm not in a bad place, maybe I'm just in, a, in kind of an okay place. And uh, we have to clear our thinking and, and figure the, the, the point A and the point B. Point B will be the next seven weeks. We, point, point A is today. Where are we at today? Now, years ago I preached a message similar to this because it, it falls in line with where we are at now. So I'm going to give you eight things this morning. So get your pen ready, eight things. We're going to blast through these things, okay? Where are we at now? We'll talk about where we need to be next time. Where are we at now? First of all, there's a problem. There's a problem, and the problem is us. Oftentimes we find in our addiction program and, and just in counseling, we find that we always assume that the problem is someone else. You know what I mean? The, the problem is something else. But when it comes to a spiritual problem, when it comes to our spiritual problems, the spiritual problem is always us. We have a spiritual problem. And we need to, we need to overcome that spiritual problem with the help of God, of course. But we need to figure out where we're at. We have a spiritual problem today, every single one of us. And, you know, ironically, the problem is us problem is us. The very first problem is, is that we have, a, we have a real love of self. We have a love of self. That's number one. Number one out of the eight. We have a love of self. Uh, you, you just have to just pan the internet, uh, Facebook, and, uh, and you see uh, these things called a selfie, right? I think, the, I think my generation actually has done something. No, I'm kidding. We have come up with a new word. It's called a selfie, right? And, and, and we want to take the picture. I mean, you just, you look, how many of y'all have taken a selfie? Be honest with me. Come on. Come on. Right? Come on. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Okay. So, so a lot of you, there's some of you that have not, my kids have taken a selfie. They don't even have a phone. I don't know how they do this. They take a selfie with my phone, but uh, here's the thing. This, we, are, we are a love for self generation, we have this uh, this love of self, and and uh, this is what we really have to offer the world. We we offer them, we offer them us. Th- this is who we are. We like we like us, 
And this is just indicative of the latter times. Listen to 2 Timothy 3. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be, listen to this, lovers of their own self. Is that not spot on or what? We have become lovers of our own self. And goes on to give this list. It says, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, lovers of self. This, this is a, uh, I was just going to tell you, this is an epidemic in our society. There, there, is a, a, there are people who have this idea that, that we don't think highly enough of ourselves. We call it a, a, a low self-esteem. Now, I'm not saying that there, that there aren't people who, who, who maybe could think a little bit better themselves. But I think the, the majority of the problem is, is that we all think too much of ourselves. And we get into this, we get into a society where everybody, everybody has to have a trophy. That we have to be more encouraging towards people so we lift, we lift their, their spirits. I think you give people the word of God, you love them, you encourage them. But let them deal with that, okay? Here, here's what I'm saying, church. Here's what I'm saying is that we don't really, if we have a self-esteem issue, it's too high a self-esteem. That's the problem. Generally speaking, our self-esteem is too high. The way we think of ourselves is too high. It's not that we think too lowly of ourselves. It's we think too highly of ourselves. How can we, as a church, as a Christian, how can we pursue the love of God when we are lovers of our own self? See, you can't have it both ways. There's absolutely no way to love yourself and to love God at the same time. And so I see this, I see this, this uh, pendulum swinging in society, and it's probably been doing this for years and years. If you were to ask people 100 years ago, was it there? They would probably say yes. And 200 years ago, yes. And 500 years ago, yes. But I think it's becoming more pronounced today that we have a, a society that thinks so highly of ourselves and we love ourselves. And the reality is you can't love God and yourself at the same time. There has to be a surrender somewhere. There has to be a surrender. The love of self keeps us from loving God the way that we should. And when we begin to see God for who he is, we will begin to see us for who we are. We must recognize that he is the one who, who should be absorbing all of our love. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, strength. The problem is, is that we have a love for self, and right here in 2 Timothy 3, 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's the problem. That's a problem that needs to be solved. Okay, so we're lovers, of, we're lovers of our own selves, right? Uh, this, leads to, this leads to other problems. There are, it, this is just, is just the, uh, the introductory point for the next seven, essentially. Uh, we also, in loving ourselves, we are lovers of pleasure. We are lovers of pleasure. This is our, one of our human... It, it's, it's, it's interesting. This is kind of like who we are. This is our makeup, our DNA in terms of just our old nature, our, just our, our, our old man. We, we, just, uh, we want to be pleased, don't we? We want, we want pleasure. Uh, the following verses after here says this, without natural affection, this is a continuation of 2 Timothy 3, 2. It says this in verse 3 and 4, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things that are good. Ready? Here we go. Trady, heady, high-minders, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. This is indicative of this culture. We want more vacation time. We want, we want more pleasurable things in our lives. And, and when something is displeasing to us, it affects our self-esteem, right? I mean, let's just face it. It's these, these kind of tailored to, to fit each other. And, and when we love ourselves, because we love ourselves, we, we, we have become lovers of pleasure. Because we want to satisfy ourselves, we want something that's going to make us happy, so guess what? We become lovers of pleasure. 
Now, it's interesting, there's really, um, there's really no profit there in the pleasure. Uh, the, the, the profit is actually uh, just never there. Matter of fact, in Proverbs 21, 17, he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. Because someone who is just constantly loving pleasure all the time, who they love themselves, right? We love ourselves, and because we love ourselves, we want, we want all this pleasure, and we end up being a poor man. It doesn't say you end up being a rich man. It says you end up being broke. That's what that means. We become poor. This is the fate of someone who loves pleasure. Now let me say this. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life. For God has given us, uh, us all things to enjoy. He has done that. And there's nothing wrong with the enjoyment of pleasure. But when we love ourselves, we end up living our lives for the pleasure. Everything becomes, what can I get out of it? And we're going to get into that in just a second. It's not wrong to enjoy things. It's when we begin to love pleasure. So first of all, we have the love of self. We have the love of pleasure. And friends, let me tell you this. If you want a better life, you have to have this right perspective. You have to have this right perspective because when it's all about you and all about loving yourselves and loving your own pleasure and just loving to have things and just loving this pleasure, uh, we're going to miss the better life. Uh, okay, how about number three? Number three, the love of preeminence. The love of preeminence. And uh, this is kind of the me first mentality. It's, it's, it's I want to be, in, I want to be first. Uh, and, and there was a problem with this. Uh, uh, the Apostle John writes about it in 3 John 1, verse 9. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that we weren't received because there was someone else, Diotrephes, who loved to be first. Who loved to be first. I never find people cut into the back of the line. <laughs> they always go to the front of the line, you know, because they want to be first. Now, we, I do, I, I don't say I do that, but I mean, that's our natural bent. Our natural bent is to want to be the first one, to be the, the first in line. Now, I think that we could learn something from this because, uh, because that's kind of our natural old man bent. We have to ask ourselves, what, is, what does the new man require? And really, that is uh, letting someone go first. I mean, honestly, right? I mean, uh, letting someone ahead of the line. Let, it, let, someone, let someone be in front of you. Now, I know what's going to happen next Third Sunday Fellowship. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to take the first plate, okay? Now, that's not what I'm getting at. I want, I'll do it. Matter of fact, just let me, let me fix that. Anyway, <laughs> I'll take the preeminence. <laughs> anyway, so uh, here's what I'm saying. Let people in front of you. Don't always put yourself in, in the first place. Christ ought to be ultimately the preeminent one. And from that, we have to surrender ourselves to others and say, hey, I don't need to be first. The Bible says the first shall be last. <laughs> Let someone go ahead of you. I remember when we were down in Texas for the Hurricane Harvey thing, and that was really, really fun. We, we, had, um, we went into this Whataburger, right? That's, that was pretty. Did somebody just groan? Did somebody go, you, you had a Whataburger? Yeah? Okay, so this is a really neat place. And, and uh, there was about 12 of us, and, uh, and we, we were there standing, and we're at Whataburger. This isn't McDonald's, so it's not like, I'll just take a number four, just across the board. I've never been to Whataburger, you know? And uh, so we're standing in line, all 12 of us. This gentleman comes up in the back. He is... Uh, he just a, seemed like a nice guy. And I was like, hey, just go ahead of us. We're, we don't know what we're getting. We're just we're from the Midwest, <laughs> as if he couldn't tell. Anyway, so, uh, so he, he went in front. I said, I said, why don't you go in front of us? He said, no, 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 you go, you go, you go. And I'm like, oh, all right, it's going to do maybe a few minutes. He says, oh, no problem. So there we were, we're ordering, and we're trying to figure it out, all 12 of us, not really sure. I mean, just a burger, you know, get the shake and the fries, whatever. And uh, after about 10 minutes, we ordered. I turned back and, and, uh, and I said, you know, I'd like to pay for this guy's meal. And, uh, and he says, no, you won't. You guys down here to help for the hurricane? I said, well, we are, but I want to pay for No, I'm paying for you. And he steps forward. I mean, it's like a hundred bucks. It's like, where were you yesterday? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But <laughs> I don't think I Did I say that? Okay, I don't remember what I said. 
Just never know what comes out sometimes. So, um, so let this guy go, or you know, pay for us. And by the way, that's really weird. You know, it's like, oh, this isn't like a five dollar thing. You know, but um, but he was driving a F three fifty King Ranch. <laughs> so I looked at, I was like, oh, maybe he can afford this. I can't afford it. Praise God for him. Anyway, so uh, where was I going? So he so he gave us the preeminence. He let us go. And then, in turn, I wanted to put him first. And you know what happened? He then put me first. Isn't that neat? See how it just kind of reciprocal like that? He, he kind of, we, we were trying to bless each other. And it, I thought it was just, just really neat. We have to let people go in front of We have to give other people preeminence. We have a problem. We love the preeminence. We love the preeminence. We love pleasure. We love ourselves. Uh, here's another one. How about the love of money? The love of money. And again, remember this. This is for the better life. We're looking ahead, asking ourselves the question, how do we have the better life? First of all, it's not the love of preeminence. It's not the love of pleasure and not the love of ourselves. Okay, uh, And it certainly isn't the love of money. Uh, this is where I think there's a lot of spi- really spiritual people I see that actually, that actually kind of go the wrong direction, uh, where they actually love the money. I had a guy tell me this week, they said, Pastor... Money isn't the problem. And I said, you're right. And he says, it's the love of money. And I said, that's right. And in 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, uh, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced them, themselves through uh, with many sorrows. It was the love of money, and they end up not being where they should be. Uh, it's amazing to me that a person can love something so much that they go astray from the, from, from the one who has provided the money, right? So when we have a right perspective that this actually comes from God, there should be no reason to, there should be no reason to love the money. We use the money for the glory of God, and, and, and that's how we do it. We take that money, we, we apply it to the, to the principles that God has asked us, be good stewards of it. Uh, there have been people that I, that I have heard who have, uh, who have gone astray in their pursuit of money to give money for the right reasons. But they loved it so much that they went astray from the one who provided it. So, so there's a problem there with the love of money. And now let's face it, friends. If you have a love of yourself and you love pleasure and you love the preeminence, you're going to love money because money provides the preeminence and the pleasure from, for yourself. So, again, these are all interconnected. Again, the problem being, the, the main problem being that we love ourselves so much that we get caught in this trap. Yeah, how, how about this one? This is a, this is a, a real common one, the, the love of the world. The love of the world. We are told in 1 John 2, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, right? The love of the world is a, is a trap. It's a snare. And quite frankly, there's, uh, we all have a problem with loving something in the world. And if, and if there's not, marketing helps us to love that thing that we didn't even want to begin with. How many of you all have bought something that you didn't need? Every one of you, you know you have. Just because it was marketed, and I tell you, they, they're really good at that, by the way. They know to send me the Menards catalogs. Because there are there's stuff in there I don't need. And you know what? You begin to look at it, and you're like, wow. Could use one of those. No, I can't use one of those. What am I doing? I don't need one of those. I haven't ever needed one of those. Why would I need one right now? You know? So marketing has done that, trying to get us to buy things, to, 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 to get things that we actually don't, we actually don't need. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, interesting. There's a forsaking going on of, of, of something that is godly and right because... Because you love the world so much. You love the world so much. So we have to be very, very, very careful of this. Uh, this, this love of the world derails so many people. Uh, and and, and we, always, we always put it, we always have an idol, don't we? We have an idol in, in a sense, in a sense. There's something that we put before God. Uh, D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody says, You don't have to go to heathen lands to find false gods. Uh, America is full of them. Whatever you love more than God is your idol. And that's so true. And I've said oftentimes, I mean, I love my wife, but I love God more. 
I love my kids, but I love God more. And that puts things in a right perspective in my life. God forbid he takes my family from me, but I haven't lost my one true love, which is God. You have to be very careful of that. Uh, seventh, or sixth rather, sixth. I was going to skip one on you. Uh, six. We only have seven of these things, actually, so we're almost, we're closing the gap here. The love of praise. The love of praise. So we have a love of the world, five. Number six, the love of praise. Uh, this, is, this is really a, a simple one. People love to be praised. People love to be praised. And there was problems with this in the New Testament. John speaks of this. Uh, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, referring to believing on him as in Christ. Many believed on Christ. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. So many chief rulers in the synagogues actually believed in Christ, but there were Pharisees that kept them from believing or from confessing them among men. And here's what he says, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So here's the picture. Here were these, here were these, uh, uh, these chief rulers in the synagogue. They believed in Christ, and the religious zealots uh, would have persecuted them and just booped them right out of the church. So guess what? They didn't confess them openly. Here is what happened. Here is four, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They wanted praise in the synagogue. They wanted praise in the synagogue for what they were doing, these chief rulers, that they wouldn't actually confess God because they were afraid of what other people would say of them because they wanted the praise of man. They were, they were more concerned about what, what man says about them than what God would say about them. This is a terrible place to be. People, people we love the praise of men. Right? We, we're, we're, again, we're, we're in, the, we're in the, the, the age of everyone gets a trophy kind of thing. right? We, we all want an award. Right? Well, what's this purpose of trying your best and running a race and winning if everybody gets the award? <laughs> you know, we, we, all want, we all want to win, but not everybody gets the award. And you know what? Not everybody's going to get praise. Now, I, 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 love, I love praising people. I love being thankful. I was saying, good job, keep up the good work. I really enjoy that because I think there's not enough of that in our world today. There's nothing wrong with being praised, so to speak, but loving praise comes from loving the world, which comes from loving the money, which comes from uh, you know, uh, loving preeminence and, and, and all of these other things right back to the very beginning where we have a love for ourselves. If you want a better life, we have to bring this into, in, into, uh, into clarity and ask ourselves, how do we get to where we need to be? We have to figure out where we're at. And where we're at right now is a place where we spend so much time thinking about us. Lastly, and this is really, this is really a, a mind blower, uh, the love of darkness. The love of darkness. This is a tough one, and here's why. Uh, people love darkness because what light uncovers. It's amazing that we are in a society where we're afraid to see something. When, when asked if, if you were in the hospital, if, they, if, if, you were, if you were there, and they say, would you like to know, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, would you like to know what's wrong? And Some people just would rather not know at all. They don't want to go get the tests, the blood work. And, and, I, and I'm just telling you outright, when, when I was uh, last November, when, when they had to pull like a trillion vials of blood, it was a lot. It was anemic by the time they were done. They, they had all these vials of blood, and I didn't really want them to look at it, you know, because I know that this could be bad. But really what needs to be done is we need to examine that under the microscope, see how that fit in there real nice? Anyway, we need to, we need to examine what's really there to be able to get it out and to deal with it, right? The love of darkness. People don't like the light because it reveals what the darkness hides. Listen to this, John 3, 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness, get this, rather than light because their deeds are evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. We're so afraid to come to God because he's the, 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 the abundance of light. He is the source of light. 
We're afraid to come to him because what he might say about us, what it might reveal about us. Verse 21, but he that doeth, or doeth truth cometh to the light that uh, his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought of God. You have to be very careful of loving darkness. We shouldn't love darkness because what it hides, we should love light because what it reveals. We should be able to, we should be able to ask for truth. I've had uh, one, one individual said to me this week, I love, I love the truth because it's true. And, and, and we can trust in that. We can trust in that. We don't have to trust in my opinion. We don't have to trust in, 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 in education. We don't have to. We just trust the, the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. This is where it's really at. We, we, can, we can come to this for answers. We don't have to be scared of what God has to say. We can be encouraged by what he has to say. We can be encouraged by this. But men love darkness rather than than light because their deeds are evil. I believe this is why people don't receive the gospel. I truly believe that. I believe the people, I mean, we, we have the greatest message in all the world. Jesus saves. But we're so afraid that he is going to point out areas in our life that maybe need, maybe need tooling, maybe need refining. We're afraid to come to Christ and receive him as our savior we're afraid of accepting that free gift because that free gift means that i have just admitted that there is a god and i am not in control and i sure love myself and if i because i love myself and because i love my pleasure follow me if i love myself and i love my pleasure and i trust christ he might take my pleasure from me he might show me that what i consider pleasure is actually not right so I, don't, I think that's one reason why people don't, they, I don't want to go to church. Because it's convicting. Because what the Bible says is true, and it's abrasive against the darkness. Because this is the light. So when you say to somebody, this is true, and they say, well, this is what I believe, and you say, well, this is what the Bible believes, or says, this is what the Bible says is what you believe, and you're wrong, that's abrasive. And now, now because of that, they have, to, they have to reconcile this. Well, am I going to trust that, that there is a God who saves me? Or am, I going to be, or am I going to be just fine in the darkness? And if you come to the light, it's going to reveal some things in your life that might need to be changed. Not in order to go to heaven, but He is going to reveal some things in your life that need to be changed. I guarantee that. And you know what? Even someone who isn't saved, who hasn't trusted Christ as their Savior, knows that that is going to happen. Not just a possibility, but it's a fact. If you're going to grow in Christ, if you admit that there is a Creator, you are accountable to Him. Pretty scary deal. Don't be afraid of, of the light. Don't be afraid of the light. We should not love darkness. We shouldn't love darkness. We shouldn't love praise. Just don't love yourself. Just love God. You know, God loves you. And He loved you so much, He sent His Son to die for you. That was, that was pretty selfless. He didn't put Himself first. He put you first. Pleasure for Him would have been to stand in front of the, 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 the persecutors the, and, say, and say, hey, I don't want to suffer like this. He wasn't trying to receive praise when he actually, when he stood before, before the governor and he says, hey, you know, basically, are you the Christ? He didn't say anything. And he marveled, right? He wasn't trying to give, get praise. He was trying to give praise to God. He was trying to live a life not for himself, but for you and for me. And he loved us so much he died for us. You know what's, you know what's marvelous? Is, is we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should embrace that. We should be excited that, there, that God in heaven died on the cross for us and paid for our sin debt. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know for sure where you're going when you die, I'm just going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lay it out for you, right? 
It's raining outside. The roads are slick. You have the typical Sunday driver. Right? This is Davenport. I hope you all make it home. But if you don't, are you sure you know where you're going when you die? I want to show you this illustration. I want this hand to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. Here's what the Bible said. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible says that, that we all have sin and come short of God's glory. That's his perfect mark, the perfect standard, perfection. We've missed that. Every one of us has missed that. The Bible says that there's not a righteous man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You are in the same category. You have this sin just like I do. The Bible says that the wages of this sin is death. The wages of this sin is death. The wages of sin is not church membership. It's not water baptism, not raising a hand, walking an aisle, giving money to the church. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. This hand right here, and I mean it reverently, represents the Lord Jesus who 2,000 years ago came to the earth to die, right? The wages of sin is death. He came to die on the cross for your sin. To make the payment that you couldn't make and get the results that you couldn't get. You can die and try to pay for the sin and spend an eternity separated from God. Or you can trust by faith alone that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. And the Bible says that if you believe that, if you trust that, if you trust that Jesus died for your sin, you will have an eternity with him. You will spend an eternity. You will live forever in eternity with God. Friends, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Why are we so afraid to trust that someone else made the payment for us? We should embrace it. We should, we should, in our minds, we should be able to clearly say that there is a God and He loves us. And he, we are accountable to Him, by the way. We are accountable to God, by the way. But you know what? Let me tell you, this is a wonderful thing. This is not something we need to be afraid of. We should embrace it. We should trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross to make the payment for our sins. You say, well, I try to live a good life. You say, well, being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to go to heaven. You've got to be perfect to go to heaven. And the only one that was perfect was Christ who died on the cross for your sin. And I pray that if there's anybody here today that has not trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that in the quietness of their own mind they believe they would trust Him, that they would trust that Jesus died for them.